Hello, Houston. We finished uh, in a rather casual way last time, and I want to go back and look at um, some of the last elements of Section 3 in, um, in perception. So we're going to start with that and just remind you that what we were looking at last time was feature theory uh, and examining particularly issues of things like synthesis or analysis by synthesis, where the first step is essentially uh, to break down patterns of incoming sensory information into whatever are their constituent components. And the result of that is that basically when you're looking at something like the letter F, what you do is to break that down according to the, the feature theory into the components of which it is constituted. And in that case, then you get the vertical line and two horizontal lines, and that those are the features that are included in this particular um, theory um, in terms of breaking down the stimulus F. What that then would lead to as a prediction is that if we think about what are the mistakes that we might make when you just see the word, the letter F for a second and it's removed, you might get it confused with letters like B or E or F or H or P or R or T, all of which tend to have significant vertical and horizontal components in terms of what they're, what they're doing. And so basically a decision then is made essentially by assessing the amount of evidence required for correct recognition response to occur. We would predict on that basis, essentially, the reaction time to make a same or a different judgment would vary significantly based on which two stimuli we were presenting to you. So if we were presenting, for instance, an O and a W, it would be a snap. You could very easily make the decision with two of them together on the screen. They're different from each other. On the other hand, if we presented an O and a Q, now there's a significant overlap between the two uh, stimuli in terms of the features that are reflected in each of them. And so it makes it a, uh, a harder decision to, to uh, demonstrate. What I'm going to do now on the screen, if they would remove my feature from the screen here for a minute, magnificent as it is, let's don't look at me for a minute. What I'd like you to do is focus your, your eyes right where the circle is on the screen. And then what I'm going to do is to present a letter very briefly and remove it. And your question, your challenge then is to try to identify what it is. Okay, get ready. And what do you think it is? It's an A. It's not too bad. Okay, let's try it again. Focusing there. And there you see there is the basis for some degree of, of confusion between the A and the R when you're looking at them. And in essence, the, the, um, what's, what's really going on here, again, is focusing on the features of the incoming stimulus. And so we're going to define a feature essentially as a basic element or component of a complex stimulus pattern. Now, letters aren't, letters aren't particularly complex, but um, the words, when they start appearing in sentences, as, for instance, in the definition, definition there do tend to lend to, to complexity. And so basically when we look at other letters, V is, is divisible into two components. A confusing element then would be W, where we've got the same thing but it's doubled. So now you've got four elements that you have to worry about. And then you look at something like Z and the combinations begin to compound and increase. We can look also at, at um, rounded letters like O and Q and P and so forth um, and begin to see that other potential elements. So that basically in terms in terms of describing a letter's feature in this way, it would also necessitate that the, the um, feature include various kinds of obtuse angles and curves and the orientation of those curves and, and so forth. Obviously, by analogy, the description and recognition of speech is based, according to this theory, on an analysis of the, of the constituent elements or features of the spoken word, whether it's the phonemes that are involved, the particular sound units, the stress, the time delays, all of which we'll talk about about later when we look at recognition of language. But this, that the perception of language could be explained in terms of uh, feature theory. In case of feature theory, what's really stored in long-term memory is thought to be feature lists, that is, lists of features. Recognition means a sensory stimulus requires that the pattern be analyzed into its constituent elements, and then those elements are compared against what is stored in memory. The difficulty there is that you begin to run into problems related to a concept you may have studied at some point in philosophy called Occam's razor, which you will remember is basically psychologists' idea that we, we will adapt, we will adopt the theory that makes the least number of undemonstrable assumptions in, in, its, uh, in, in justifying itself. And template theory required a huge number of templates. If you remember, we had to store everything. And the reaction time data just didn't, didn't fit 
fit with the kind of, of data that we have in terms of, of frequency or ease of identification. Feature theory minimizes this demand for having each different template stored. And you've got one list of features which is utilized to perceive all the different combinations of letters, words, and so forth and so on. So the advantage there, template theory versus feature theory, clearly goes to feature theory. Research documenting the existence of feature analysis, that is the fact that we do that, uh, is reflected in a number of different places. Uh, even going back to Hubel and Weasel's classic work on, on um, uh, vision itself, they were able to demonstrate that there are cells on the retina of the eye which fire if a stimulus is moving in a given direction, but don't fire if that same kind of stimulus is moving in the opposite direction. They were able to demonstrate that cell C fires over here when the thing is moving this way only if cell A and cell B have already fired and in that case that primes this cell then to fire but if the stimulus is moving the opposite direction since the two previous cells have not fired this one doesn't when the stimulus is moving in this direction. Um, net result there is that, that um, when we have a, um, um, that kind of general analysis leads to a prediction of the kind of errors that we will get when we do um, analysis by synthesis. Basically, patterns show up on the sensory register, which element I'm going to describe in more detail later for you. Template theory lifts the entire image and compares it across whatever is stored in memory. Feature theory, on the other hand, analyzes and lifts partial images, that is the features of the letter which is incoming extracts the features from the sensory image and then identifies the features by comparing those to what's stored in uh, memory, comparing the incoming uh, features to what is stored in memory. The decision then uh, is essentially based on, on other patterns that can be activated depending on the number of features that are shared. And so this is basically based on a synthesis of the identified features that are assembled in long-term memory. And that's what leads to, to recognition. The fact that we take whatever combination of stimuli is inbound uh, and rely on long-term memory to look at the features and then recognize it as a V, a W, or whatever it happens to be. Is this entirely data-driven? That is, is it driven entirely by the incoming stimuli? Our demonstration earlier of looking at, at um, letters and then being able to identify them uh, suggests that the context is also important under certain conditions. The context, in fact, under many conditions, the context within which a letter appears can also impact how easily we are able to, um, to identify them. For instance, um, Riker way back in 1969 was able to demonstrate a word superiority effect where if you show somebody W-O-R-K and then quiz them as on the second line, test them with that, asking what letter appears where the question mark is, they see only work and then three blanks and a question mark. The ability to supply K in that blank is much more rapid. The reaction time is much shorter than if they look at O-W-K-R, that is the, the letters randomly ordered, and are then given the blank. So in essence, on screen at any given time, you'd see only one line of what I've got on the screen there, but the reaction time is much longer in supplying the correct letter in position four in the second stimulus than it was in the, um, in the first. Um, and the problems with this are, are that is with, with uh, feature theory, are several fold. First of all, and this as a demonstration of it, the likelihood of guessing the correct letter in a word context is higher than in a non-word context. That is, when you've got just a random assemblage of letters, any of the 26 might potentially be there, even filtered through the frequency with which they are regularly used. As we see on Wheel of Fortune, you know there that R, S, T, L, and E are the, are the ones that are most, that they give to you already, because those are also the most frequently used letters. It's, it's based simply on frequency of use. And then the other popular ones are, are guessed kind of in order. In some ways, that's a very predictable game, even though chance plays the, the major role in it. Confusion can result while we're still trying to process things like nonsense words. That becomes a problem for us because we're just not used to having that random collection of features in the, in the verbal stimuli that we, um, that we 
we work with. So analysis by synthesis suggests basically that what context does is to narrow the choice of patterns on the sensory register. It, it gives us practice or experience in, in narrowing in on what we're trying to identify. And this would be true, for instance, if you had a wheelbarrow in your backyard and the ease of, of finding it. You would know uniquely what you were looking for by way of a pattern. You look at the face of a friend, even if it's covered by a bandage. You can still recognize that friend when half the face is obliterated because the context of the overall pattern is there and half is sufficient for you to be able to identify who it is, who's the other half that's hidden behind the bandage there. Um, if the friend doesn't have freckles, um, you don't expect to see them. All right, that's, that is part of your experience of knowing that particular person. And so when you see the, the face half covered by a bandage, freckles is not among the things that you're looking for and you're able to fill in the, um, the context that is, leads you to expect a particular pattern once you recognize the partial pattern that is there. Um, when you and I read, for instance, we do not read each individual letter. That is what I'm suggesting is we have to go beyond the fact that V is this line and this line in terms of a feature. We rather put that V in a context of a word like very or superfluous. No V there, right? Um, so what we do is, is to study this in, in rather interesting ways, and it has the, this combination of features in the context of a context leads us to be able to explain something like, if I say to you, neighborhood, that is the way you hear it. But if I instead record something where I say, neighborhood, you still hear neighborhood. Now, I had to extend that a little bit, but they have done that with electronic recording, where in fact they, um, they, they do a very pronounced cough and shorten it so that it covers just the, the, the phoneme that is involved when you're saying the middle sound in, in neighborhood, uh, middle syllable, I should say, in neighborhood. People don't even hear it. They simply, you know, if you put neighborhood in the context of a sentence and read the sentence with the cough obliterating the B-O-R, people don't even hear it. The context allows them to just fill in the entire word in terms of what we actually mean. You see that to a certain extent in speeded speech, which is a whole different area. But in fact, you and I will listen occasionally to commercials here in Houston um, where the, the auto dealer or whoever has a whole series of qualifiers to the sale that they give. They're not really interested in telling you all the conditions under which they won't give you the outrageous price that they're advertising. And so what they do is go to a very high speed. You can't even mimic that directly, and yet they can compress it enough so that you and I can still recognize if we care to pay attention to the message, even though it is played even at double speed. There's some people that can even do it at triple speed and still understand totally what's being done. So they've met the letter of the law, if not the spirit, because I'm sure you don't, like I don't, take the time to carefully filter out whatever they're saying, just recognize, yeah, yeah, there are conditions, and so forth. So, let's go to another model. Let's look instead at what we're going to call a structural theory. Um, for instance, if you go back and look at the picture of two objects that we showed you here, we're going to show you a bucket and a cup, which we looked at uh, in the last tape, and we'll just put that image on screen for you here. Um, and in essence, the, the feature theory bases our recognition on matching features of the sensory stimulus with long-term stored feature lists. And so in essence, when you look at those two objects, the bucket and the cup, um, there are obvious differences. That is, for the bucket, the handle is on top. For the cup, it's on the side. And, and yet spatial orientation becomes very important there because if the handle of the cup were on top, we couldn't use it. It wouldn't, yeah, you could get the fluid out, but you certainly wouldn't use the handle for what it's intended for, and that is holding the cup. So in essence, even though in, at some level you might be able to describe both of those features, both of those objects, in terms of a cylinder and a circle, a semicircle, serving as a handle on top in one case and on the side in the other case, um, there, there is a crucial difference there, even in two dimensions. Um, and that generalizes also to things like, um, like letters. Order effects are important, up versus PU, in terms of what you're communicating to people. So the order effect is crucial, as it is with the, uh, the bucket as opposed to the cup, in terms of where the semicircle is. That is where the handle is. So in essence, um, parts may be three-dimensional, they can also be two-dimensional. But in essence, what structural theory is attempting to do is 
is to correct the obvious difficulty that features have if you try to describe the bucket and the cup strictly in terms of features. Yes, we can talk about a semicircle and a cylinder, but clearly the orientation of those two identical features is quite different depending on which we're talking about in that situation. And so in essence, um, these are, are basically components of an object. Biederman, in 1987, proposed a theory which basically argues in terms of recognition by components. And the concept that he used in terms of the structural theory that this became a component of, um, to separate out the components there of bucket versus cup, was a concept called the geon. And the geon is defined by Biederman essentially as a long-term memory stored representation of geometrical shapes, okay? Objects are stored as lists of geons, including things like spatial orientation. So what's involved here is essentially feature recognition. It's, it's a division of perceived objects into geons and then comparison of the list of the features of whatever we're looking at, cup or bucket or, or whatever, with lists that are stored in the, in the long-term memory. That is what it's arguing is that when we have a concept like cup, it is represented in memory by the idea of a cylinder and a semicircle or some abstraction of that on the side rather than on the top. So when it's a pail that we're trying to describe or store or match, we're looking for, yes, the geon of, of cylinder and the geon of, of semicircle, but in the in the instance of pale, the semicircle is on top. So the numbers of features in feature theory was never specified. It was kind of unlimited. But the decline is obvious here because in essence what we're moving to from, from patterns which are innumerable, infinite essentially, we get to features and they're somewhat limited. Biederman argued that, that geons could be accomplished with just three dozen of them, 36. So across those three theories, template, feature, and then structural, we are clearly moving toward a more efficient, limited number of, of, of combinations of, of aspects that can be combined then to describe any of the concepts that we actually need. And when we study line drawings, what we find in terms of, of structural theory is that we recognize figures depicted only with the largest geons almost as fast as the whole picture. That is, you remember the bucket that I had on screen a couple of minutes ago, the orange thing, had several rings down from the top, there was a slight taper to it, and so forth, but that was really incidental to what we were really checking when we had looked at it and said, oh, that's a bucket. And in fact, the geons are what are on the screen now. That is simply the semicircle and the, uh, and the cylinder. The more geons that are present, the greater the speed in correctly recognizing the figure. Now that might be a little bit counterintuitive, but what it's really arguing is that the more geons we pile on in this case, the more accurately or rapidly we can identify the figure. And yet, there are still problems that remain. You may have already snapped to the idea, well now wait a minute, I don't think I can recognize the entire, represent the entire world just with 36 abstractions. And that is a problem. Can you name the objects, objects that cannot be depicted by geons? For instance, a waterfall. You and I would have no trouble at all identifying a waterfall or using that same model. Think of the image that you get reflecting off the top of water in a swimming pool. Again, that would be very difficult to reflect with geons because it's a constantly shifting pattern of, yes, circles and semicircles, but in fact it's much more complex than just a bunch of semicircles floating around on, on the surface there. So that there are problems still with, with, um, with, with um, the use of geons. Hunt and Ellis in 1999 note that different areas of the brain are used in, to process words like bird than word-like letter sequences such as board, B-O-R-D, no A in that particular instance, than in nonsense combinations, R-K-C-I, for instance, my name totally obliterated in terms of, of order effects. Perhaps what's going on here is some combination across the three different elements that we've talked about. For instance, it might be a feature analysis that's going on. The template theory mechanism is, is too slow. But what if preliminary processing of features and of structures reduced or confined which area the brain needs to seek? 
the matching template. That is, if we did a kind of a pre-editing and then simply process the results of that, that might reduce the demands on, on memory that we would have to perform. Preliminary processing of lines and, and geons might feed forward to impact pattern recognition, yet the primed, and this may be it, the primed pre-identification of a pattern may feed backward in the system to influence the simpler processing of angles and lines. In other words, there may be feed forward and feed back that is occurring, which is another thing that we haven't yet examined in all of these processes, which leads us then ultimately to the fourth explanation that I'd like to offer and the final one in this third section of material. And that is that we may be engaged in what's called parallel distributed processing. It took a long way to get to this, but in essence a major step in a very different direction here. That is that whereas preceding theories have assumed that identification occurs as a kind of a, a center where enough cues have been assembled, in the PDP model, what's going to be assumed here is that the processing itself is what leads to identification. That is, how we do the processing really leads us to the identification. The PDP model basically assumes that the processing of each letter in a word begins simultaneously. The word as a whole and the letters constituting the word are both being processed simultaneously. Not in a series, but rather identifiably simultaneously. What this implies is that the parts of an object or a word are processed at the same time that the gestalt or whole of the object is being processed. That is, we're looking at the letters and its constituent elements and at the same time at the word as a whole. And again, it's being done in parallel. That is, parallel processing. Knowledge, per se, is not in a single neuron somewhere, but rather it's distributed across the connections that the, that the individual identifies in identifying whatever units are, are, are being examined. So in essence, what we have then is parallel processing. This is a model of what might be going on. Consider the diagram here with elements or features at the bottom and letters in the middle and words at the top. When letters are perceived, they elicit responses from selected features. Thus T, for instance, elicits a positive from the vertical line and from the horizontal line. In order for you to be able to see that, I have only taken one of those, the horizontal line, and shown how the model might process it. In essence, although it's a little hard to see on the screen there, there isn't. If you don't see a circle at the end of a line, which is indicating a block that is no link, uh, what you get instead is an arrowhead. So an arrowhead is simply connecting positively in, in a particular direction. Um, in essence, when letters are perceived, they elicit responses from selected features, as I said. So a T elicits a positive from the vertical as well as the horizontal line, and in turn, T responds positively to any words containing T, as you can see in the model. So the, the reaction to T uh, would be positive to, to everything up there except Abel over on the left side. Um, a, on the other hand, would be positive not to all of them, but to, uh, to some of them, and so forth. So that in essence, what's, what's arguing here is that those connections can be either excitatory or inhibitory. It can go either way. In some cases, it, it excites, and in other cases, it, it uh, retards or inhibits what's going on. So these connections develop in response to experience. We become better at identifying features, looking at the, the um, dealing with words, basically. McClelland and Rummelhart in 1981 proposed that when work is presented, if the K is partially blocked, the W, O, and R are recognized based on signals from individual elements, for instance, the left-leaning and right-leaning lines and so forth. But those activities, um, but that also activates a word like word, okay? Work, weak, wart, and so forth. And so in essence, the, the work wins because of the cumulative positive stimulation from W, O, and R is stronger than the weak WEAK, and yet stimulation of K is strengthened in weak and work, but work is inhibiting weak, and shortly weak fades and work wins. So what I'm arguing basically there in a very complex description of a very complex model is that the processing is simultaneous. You're looking at models or, or elements which are features which are acting upward to impact the letters that are perceived, and you're looking at words, the weight of which is acting downward in this model, to impact which letters are most likely to be perceived as constituent elements in a given word. With that, we're then going to move into a second element of perception and our topic for today, which is basically attention. 
When we look at attention, we are going to define it essentially as in two different ways, basically. First of all, we're going to, to look at what William James had to say about it way back in 1890. He described attention as the taking possession by the mind in clear and vivid form of one out of what seem several simultaneously possible objects or trains of thought. Focalization, concentration of consciousness are of its essence. It implies withdrawal from some things in order to deal effectively with others. That's basically attention that he's talking about. I have way too many letters on the screen there, but in essence it is in your cognitive psych, the book, book in in translatable English, and I will try to avoid those kind of definitions generally. But one of the definitions technically is that attention is the tendency of an organism to focus or concentrate on certain aspects of its environment. And another way to define it, even heavier than the other one, is essentially to define attention as a cognitive link between the vast array of information available through our senses, memories, and other cognitive processes, and the small amount of information that we actually manipulate. We do not process. If you look around the room you're sitting in right now, there are literally millions of pieces of information that are hitting you or could become the object of your focus. If you're sitting on something like a plaid chair, any given square within that plaid could become the object of focus. Multiply that by the number of crossing lines in that plaid pattern or look at the individual nuances of color within one of those squares. And you very quickly get to the point where the world just offers way, way too much information for us to process. And so when we look at perception relative to the way it's covered in sensory processes, we're gonna look at a very limited element of the, of the overall um, subject, and that is to look specifically at attention as an, as an important element, because in all the scanning that we are capable of doing, we really have to focus ourselves in some way on the relevant aspect of our environment. How is this related to consciousness or awareness? Is it the same as awareness of, uh, of something that's going on? At one time we thought so. It's now perceived as separable from awareness or consciousness. Okay? Automatic processes do occur unconsciously. We're not always aware of what it is that brings our attention to a particular object, but it is occurring. As an example, uh, in the days immediately before my dad died, he had to sign numerous documents because he was in the process of setting up a trust. And it was, it was fascinating to watch because he always during his life had a beautiful signature bearing no resemblance to the scratch that passes for my signature. But in essence, in, in the last days of his life, as I said, he signed 20, 30, 100 documents authorizing and establishing the trust with the intended targets that he, he had in mind for it. The fascinating thing was that if he started it, he could do his whole signature with no problem. It was very easy, even though he was, he was um, near death from cancer. But if, once you got the paper in front of him and explained to him what was involved, he could do the entire signature flawlessly. And it didn't look any different than it had 40 years earlier when he died at age 78. But what I noticed was that if he got interrupted at any point, if, if something caught his attention when he was doing the signature and stopped, he could not start it in the middle fascinating. He just, he couldn't do it. He literally had to go back to the beginning and do the K Cashaw, which was his initial and name, uh, right from the beginning. So he'd have to overwrite whatever part of, of the thing that he had started. Try that with your own signature and you'll find it a little bit more difficult. That is, if you, if you, I have an eight letter last name and if I get halfway through it and then something interrupts me, I can pick up in the middle and go on with it and it looks as scratchy as ever. But it does take a little extra effort. Try that with your name, just writing your signature and then go back and try again go part way through the last name and then pick it up again. And you find that it is a more difficult thing because that is a, a, um, a gestalt, uh, that entire motor action that you do in, in doing your signature. Um, what we're gonna say then is, is that attention is now considered to be awareness of evaluating the environment and filtering through your mind um, exactly what features of that environment you wanna pay attention to. I'm gonna argue that there are basically three different groups which impact attention when we're paying attention to it. There are three different kinds of factors. The first of these are external factors which concentrate on aspects of the stimulus. That's what advertisers manipulate when they are trying to get our attention, okay? And those are n numerous in form. For instance, um, when you look at um, examples of, of um, external factors that impact us, when you're standing right inside a screen door in the summertime looking out through it, 
you don't even notice the screen. If you're looking at a dog or a person that's outside or something like that, that screen isn't even there. And yet if you focus in on your vision, you can then pay attention to it. You can bring it forward. That becomes the object that you're attending to. It's an external stimulus that you're doing. You can hear your name in a cocktail party. You're interacting with somebody and somebody in the next group over mentions your name and all of a sudden you're grinning at the people here but you're listening over there as to what's actually going on. That's another example of where a stimulus has come in uh, that you're paying attention to even though it was not part of the, of the interaction that you were directly in, in charge of. Um, the, initial stage, the initial stages of getting a date for this Friday night are a matter of attention getting. You're paying attention to who among the available people you want to date and you're also then trying to make yourself an object that becomes of attention to that individual. So attention plays a number of, of, um, of, of roles in, in, in our everyday interaction. The last couple of examples, advertising and, and trying to get a date on Friday night, are really nothing more than attention getting. The, the maintenance, the attraction and maintaining of attention. So let's look at what's involved in those. If we look at external factors, intensity is one of the things that impacts how easily our attention can be attracted. If you've ever been watching a uh, television show, you're right in the middle of watching a movie like Love Story or, or one of the modern versions of that, and all of a sudden they cut to a commercial, you almost get blown out of your chair by how loud they've cranked the, the amplitude of the sound. It's not legal. The FCC requires not more than a 5% boost in that, but you and I know that they do it all the time. And the reason is that advertisers know that water pressure drops every 30 minutes in Houston on the hour and the half hour. They paid big bucks to bring that program to you to attract your attention to that channel, and they want to make sure that people pay attention. So knowing that you're over in the bathroom, they crank the loudness up a bit so that you'll still hear it. A second one that we also do is size. We pay attention to size. Look at this next uh, front page of a newspaper. Whoops, <laughs> another example first. We pay attention to his hand, not because this is a guy that has fingertips dragging on the ground when he's walking, but because he's put his hand up toward us. And so we, it is more obvious, it is more attention getting because it's bigger in our visual field. Here, I guarantee that the first word that you paid attention to there is Reagan. Okay, that's the uh, San Francisco Chronicle headline the, the day after the election when Reagan was first elected president. One of the best examples I've ever seen of the power of a headline. You and I read top to bottom, left to right, but the word you pay attention to first there is not election, which is what's in the upper left, it is Reagan. And the reason for that is simply size. That's what attracts your attention. Half-page ads don't attract as much attention as full-page ads. Same thing. Size attracts our attention. A third factor is movement. We can illustrate movement in a number of different ways. This is using a, uh, a, a um, what do they call it, a zoom lens to imply movement. But in essence, what it does is to draw our attention to the very center of the picture there. It's the implied movement in that case, which tends to draw our attention to where all the lines seem to be radiating from. Or this one is a sign I understand there is one down in, in Pasadena or southeast of the city here. I have not seen it, but this, this one came from Columbia, South Carolina. What it is, is a sign. It's got two uh, hemispheres rotating in opposite directions out of which exude pieces of metal that are outlined by a neon. And those tubes range from about six or eight feet up to about 12 feet. So when you've got this thing rotating against that dark sky at night, it is a very attention-getting stimulus because the, the, the two hemispheres are rotating in opposite directions. So you've got, you've got parts of the sign going in different ways. The entire thing is rotating around on the, on the horizontal dimension. And then it's got emphasis by these 12-foot these, uh, extensions off that. That movement is very attention getting in, in getting you to pay attention to the fact that, oh, it's Wilson Motors that's doing that. That's the use of movement to attract attention. So movement is, is another factor that we can manipulate. A fourth is repetition. Okay, um, any major ad campaign will do that. Uh, a number of years ago, Libby's was quite insulted that Campbell was getting so much attention with its, with its tomato juice and its vegetables. And so what Libby's did was to start an ad campaign in which the, the singers and the label would say essentially, remember if it's Libby's, Libby's, Libby's on the label, label, label. And all they were doing was repeating the name of the product three times to increase our attention to the, to the particular object. Or if you think about Coke ads, have a Coke and a smile 
style, uh, Coke, it's the real thing, Coke adds life, or the original, Coke, the pause that refreshes. That slogan is going to change about every two years in terms of the slogan, but the word Coke does not change because that's the only thing they really want to, to leave want to leave us with is that product name in our mind, not the fact that it adds life or refreshes us or anything else. So the one thing that the two things that are constant are a Coke will be repeated, but the slogan will change because they're more interested in having us remain, rem, remember the um, the product name. Um, Salem had an ad years ago that used to drive me crazy back when cigarettes could still be advertised legally. They had a ditty that ran, I counted some 58 repetitions in a one minute commercial. It was stunning how many times they did it, but they were trying to talk about the flavor of the cigarette. And what they said in the commercial was, remember, you can take Salem out of the country, but you can't take the country out of Salem. Apparently a reference to tobacco and freshness and so forth. 58 times the announcer, the singer behind the announcer, the chorus behind the singer and the announcers, or on screen, you heard or read, remember, you can take Salem out of the country, but you can't take the country out of Salem. And very predictably, at the end of that ad, five seconds, the singer, the screen, the announcer, everything say, remember, you can take Salem out of the country, but silence for five seconds and I was so annoyed that I always filled in you can't take the country out of Salem but what they've done there and there are other examples of that where, the, where they just go through it over and over and over again uh, and they get you sucked into the repetition and then they stop halfway and you, you and I'll fill it in that's perfect advertising uh, they've internalized it rather than externalized it in that case oh I did have the Libby's example sorry about that um, and then we have contrast. Contrast is another one. Um, Avis as a rental car at one time used to advertise itself as number two. Nobody does that in American advertising. You're always the biggest or the best or the something or otherist. And so uh, Avis took a different tack. They simply advertise themselves as number two, and out of that they drew the theme, which the company still uses, we try harder. We are smaller, we're trying to get bigger, and so we try harder. It's a kind of implying or representing the service that they, um, that they represent. Um, another example of contrast is in the traffic signs that we use. The only sign in traffic that requires an absolute action on our part is red. We have to stop when we see red. And the reason for that is, the reason red is used is, first of all, it's unique in nature, and secondly, uh, it, is, it has a unique activity associated with it. Slowing and speed limits and curves and all the other stuff are kind of guidance on how to behave when moving. But in fact, red is the one feature where we actually have to come to a physical stop. We cease moving. And in order to cue that with color, they use red, first of all, because it stands out, and secondly, because it is uniquely associated then with the action that's required, and that is stopping. Um, okay, let's look at the mixed factors, of which there are also a number that we could talk here. I'm going to identify only two of them. One of them is novelty. That is, you may have seen this plane at some time landing at Hobby Airport. It is a, a 737 painted to look like a whale. And in fact, it is done because they have a cooperative advertising campaign with, with SeaWorld out in, in San Antonio. That plane is very attention-getting when it comes to the airport. I've seen people go over to the window when it goes past uh, in order to, to uh, show the particular effect. The original effort to do that is an airline that no longer exists, but they actually paid a South American artist by the name of Calder to do an artistic statement on their plane. It looked like he spilled paint all over the plane. I was in New York one time at what is now Kennedy Airport when that plane landed and even staid old New Yorkers interrupted their walk down the, the hallway to go over to the window and look at it. That was an attempt at, at um, advertising and it was very effective because they were, it, and it's internal, uh, I'm sorry, it's mixed because that as an attention getting object is partly based on our seeing many planes that are always solid colors. Planes are supposed to have stripes down them or big, big bold colors. And now all of a sudden here somebody's made it no stripes and no solid colors. That becomes in and of itself very attention getting, but basically because of our past experience with the, um, with the fact of the way planes are supposed to look and that one violates it. And then we also have a, um, um, a second factor, I guess I'm not going to go into that specifically, but that is familiarity. In a cocktail party, if, if you look at a picture at a cocktail party, um, when you scan the picture, what you're looking for are people that you know. 
that's partly based on your past experience with the people who are in the photograph. But what you tend to attend to when you're looking at a photograph of people is the ones that you know within the people. So in that case, it's a mixed factor. It's based on the actual physical stimulus you're looking at, but it's also based on your experience. Um, and then we have internal factors, of which there are several. Okay, One of these is set or expectancy. I'm going to put an image on the screen and I want you to look at that for a minute and tell me if you see any particular difficulty with the image. I'm ready to put it on now. You see any problem with that? That's an example basically of set or expectancy. Because when you and I see now and time and kind of is the in the middle, we tend to interpret it simply as now is the time. But if you look at it very closely, the word the is up there twice. And in groups of 400, when I'm lecturing in, in the big introductory psych classes, I can pick out a student, you know, I will ask, how many of you see a problem? Most of the hands will go up, but I assure you, know, for some of you, there may be no problem. And among the five hands that are left, I will pick one and ask them to read it. And they will look right at that and say, three or four, I've even had them go 10 times. Now is the time. And then all of a sudden, there's an, oh, and great embarrassment uh, because they're reading it as a unit. Yet another example of the fact that when you and I process information, we do it as a gestalt, as a whole unit. And we don't even pay attention to the fact because we see now and time and is the is kind of there. And we don't really process it unit by unit. I have somebody in class here who speaks French, and I'm going to ask him to read this particular stimulus to us. See if you can tell what he is actually saying. Hey. Okay. Make lieu lieu. And try it again. Pas de luron canoe. You understand what's being said? Because I have set you to think in terms of French. But if you split it that way, what's actually being said in English is paddle your own canoe. See, so you are set to perceive that in terms of French. And that's the way you tend to process it. You don't think of it in any other terms. But in fact, phonetically, what has been intoned there is a very good replica of paddle your own canoe. Set or expectancy there is impacting what you've actually interpreted or what you've perceived in that situation. Organismic characteristics, features of you and I, can influence how we interpret particular physical stimuli, our past experience. Um, what is set? Let's look at that separately because that, in fact, actually does impact how we perceive things. Okay? And in fact, let me back up here a minute. There's one other thing I wanted to talk about, and that is motives. Motives are another internal factor that can impact how we perceive things. When you are hungry, if I were to flash an, an, an abstract picture onto the screen and take it off again, you will perceive food objects more often than if you have just eaten a big meal. So that it is clear that the way we are set internally, the way we're thinking, tends to a certain extent to impact what we perceive. We are looking then for food objects when we're hungry. Or remember when you were um, babysitting, the difficulties that you can sometimes get into there um, with, um, with thinking about a burglar, the noise outside being a burglar intent upon breaking in and doing mayhem upon your body. When you were 12 and the senior person in, in the house, the heat comes on and things start creaking and all of a sudden you're, all of those tones or sounds that you never paid attention to suddenly are signals of a burglar or something like that because you're so primed to react in that case. But in that case, you're scared because you're alone and totally responsible, which at age 12 you haven't typically been. So now let's see if we can get to the definition of set, which is what I was looking for. And that is basically an adjustment or an orientation, a preparation to respond in a particular way. That basically defines our definition of, of set. And in essence, there are a number of determining factors, a number of things which determine set. So I'm really arguing that in terms of, a, of uh, perception, there are a couple different things that impact what we do. One is attention. A second is set, the orientation that we have toward any particular stimulus that we, um, that we look at. And so prior experience is, is one of the things that impacts us. It, usually, it's very helpful. That is, the world is stable, and our experiences with it aid us in, in perceiving what's, what's going on. The best predictor of tomorrow's weather is today 
today's weather. I remember one time there was a hearing when the National Weather Service was asking for increases in federal funds, which I guess every federal agency is all the time. And one of the senators leaned into the microphone and asked whoever was then director of the National Weather Service, um, Sir, what is the, if I were to simply look out the window and predict for tomorrow what I see happening right now outside today, what would my accuracy be? And the director of the National Weather Service leaned back and talked to an expert and then came forward and said about 60, 65 percent. And then he said to the senator, well, what's your accuracy? What's the NWS accuracy on weather prediction? And the guy leaned back and talked to his expert and said about 80, 85 percent. And so the senator nailed his fanny, saying, okay, so we're asking, you're asking for blah, 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 million dollars for a 15% increase in accuracy, which is basically what it boils down to. But set is really what's involved there. Prior experience is a very good predictor of what's going to happen today in many different situations, including even the prediction of, of um, weather. You judge uh, the similarity of, of current situations as uh, the best estimator of the way to, to predict it based on, on what you've heard previously. Okay. Um, I think I have some illustrations of this, yes. Do you see any problem in this um, New Hampshire town? Sorry, it's a Vermont town. <laughs> Not that it makes a difference. See any problem on the streets here? On the environment? The word ahead is misspelled. In context previously, you have seen it so many times there, you're probably not paying too much attention to it. But in fact, if you look very closely at it, ahead has been misspelled. It's a good thing I stopped on that very dark stormy day to take that picture because the next time I was through that intersection in a sunny day, there was a very embarrassed town sign painter out there blacking out the pavement and putting in the EA correctly in that, uh, in that situation. Many people had missed it entirely, okay? Now I'm going to show you a, a, um, another impact of set. And what I want you to do here is to divide yourself, and I'm going, to, I'm going to put a whole series of images on the screen in order. What I'd like you to do is to, 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 to divide yourself in the following way. If your last name begins with A through M, I want you to shut your eyes for a minute and trust me, I will show you later what I'm going to show the people whose last name begins with N through Z. Okay? So if your, if your last name begins with A through M, shut your eyes for a minute right now, and for those of you with a name that begins with N through Z, look at these images without comment. Okay, now, if your eyes are open, you should shut them. If your eyes have been shut, you should open them. So now I'm going to show only the people whose last name begins A through M with another series of pictures. I would like you, last name beginning A through M, to keep your eyes open. The rest should shut your eyes and look at the following image. Okay, everybody now open your eyes, look at the screen and tell me this. Let's go back to the screen. How many of you see an animal? How many of you see a human? How many of you who see a human have a last name beginning with N through, M, N through Z? And you find a very high overlap there. Actually, there are two images there. That is a dual image, an ambiguous figure. If you look very closely, um, I cannot point on the screen electronically here, but the only thing that is in common to both the rat-like mechanism and the human face that can actually be seen there is the tip of the nose. The swirling line at the bottom is either the tail of a rat where the legs look like, the rear legs look like the ear of a human. The round line across the top of the image is either the back of a rat-like or mouse-like organism or it's the top of a head. And the big dual circles are either pince-nez glasses, glasses that ride on your nose, or they're the ears of the organism. And so again, the only thing on the right side is the nose. It's the nose of a rat or it's the nose of a, of a human. And what's just below the nose there is in one case an abstract of the front legs of the animal and in the other case it's the upper lip. So in fact, what's happened there is some of you saw pictures like this and the rest of you saw pictures like this. And so basically what that does is to set you 
when you look at this particular picture based on immediate experience. If you've looked at animals, you see an animal. If you've looked at humans, you see a human. Okay? I would like to thank Phil Zimbardo, who is the one that gave me um, those pictures to use in that situation. Um, but in essence, that's an example of, of where Set has been impacted by prior experience. Um, and then, as we talked earlier, you also have the internal state that you're in at any given time, um, where, and I'm not going to burden you with extra details here, but the, the idea of, of both food and, and babysitting conditions, those can impact how you react to, to particular stimuli in a given situation. And then thirdly, um, here, this is a little bit out of place, but it's rather interesting. Um, that is the world's most widely recognized industrial logo. Do you see any problem with it? Yeah, the drink is misspelled. It isn't actually. It is a sign written in Norwegian. And so it is actually correct in Norway, which is where I photographed this. But in fact, our set, I had thought I was going to be able to blow that past people. But I'm sure Coca-Cola is delighted that you and I are so concentrated on that logo that we also pick up the verb, which is what they really want us to do. That is drink the drink. Um, but internal state then impacts us. And also what I'm trying to reach for is the social factors that also impact how we react to things. This is a fascinating experiment. It was done by Solomon Ash a number of years ago. And in essence, what he did was to have seven people sitting in a, in a row, a semicircle, about 10 feet away from a screen on which was projected images like this. And he held a whole series of, of puzzles of the following type. That is, they were given a standard line and then a multiple choice test. They were asked to respond into individually, which of these lines is the same length as our standard line? And in essence, what happened there was, it was a setup. That is, six of the people in that experiment by Solomon Ash had been instructed by Ash to say, I'm sorry, let me back up a little bit. One person at the beginning of the row, the first person to respond, had a script that he was working from. And he had been instructed to follow the script. So whatever the script said was the way he guessed it across the 20 or so puzzles. So if script on, on option eight, which this might be, said A, he simply said A. And that cued the remaining five, the next five, the middle five, to say the same thing. So the five in the middle had simply been instructed, say whatever the person next to you has already said. So the guy at the end, here's six people in a row, look at that puzzle and say, A, 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 and so forth. You get to number six, and that poor guy has now had six seemingly rational people give an obviously wrong answer. What does he do? Well, about 85% of the time, he goes with the majority. If even one gives the correct answer, which is B, then his answers uh, go with the majority. That is, they look directly at, um, they, they do in fact pick the correct answer, B. You're going to sit there and let me get away with that? See the effect of social pressure? <laughs> Two or three hands in, the hands in the studio when I said that snapped up, looked. But that's social pressure. There's an authority figure that gave you an obviously wrong answer. Oh, yeah, I guess he's right. He's got a better angle on it than I do. That's exactly what happens. That's the effect of social pressure on perception. That's exactly what's happening in that situation. Illustrated then in a classic experiment by, um, by Ash. So the standard line there, um, the, the, um, the correct answer is actually the incorrect answer, I should say, is selected by about three-quarters of the people. They'll yield to group pressure. Again, a social effect that's going on. Um, and the, the um, another factor that we need to talk about then, a, a third factor which impacts how we perceive things, has to do with stimulus variation, which also turns out to be important. Attention and set, in fact, all normal operations in a perceptual process depend on an adequate variety of stimulation. Might not seem to be particularly crucial, but it is. If you're going to be isolated on a desert island, you could rank order from the most to the least preferred those things that you would like to spend time with. Um, yet even the most interesting um, person uh, is going, would become essentially boring because of the limited set of stimuli that that person could offer, whether they're very attractive or very physically active or whatever. Um, the whole situation eventually becomes boring even if they have a good sense of humor because, you know, there's no variation in it. There were two different ways in which this was, um, in which this was studied. One of them was a, um, well, I'm going to not go to that yet. I'm going to talk about that some more. Um, 
One of them was a study done by Bexton, Heron, and Scott over 50 years ago now, in which they did a very interesting thing. What they did was to bring undergraduates at McGill University into the psychological laboratory, and they paid them the equivalent in modern dollars of $100 a day to do nothing. They were put into an enclosed area, essentially a small uh, lab space, that had several features to it. First of all, vision was eliminated. What they did, and it was very clever the way they did it, they cut a ping pong ball in half and then simply taped it over the, the eyes. So the eyes worked perfectly well. They'd move around, but you couldn't see anything. It was just a uniformly white field. Sound was, was eliminated or was controlled by having an air conditioner running it at a civil temperature that his temperature was adapted to, to an, an average level. But the sound of the air conditioning basically muted all of their sound in the, in the, um, in the lab area. So they had uniform sound, uniform uh, vision, and they had been asked to wear cardboard sleeves. You can come back to me as a picture if you'd like. Um, they had just cardboard sleeves on, and the agreement was that they would not flop around a lot in bed. That is, they were to maintain as close to steady sensory stimulation in terms of touch as they could, and they were not to be touching their body all the time. So they had cardboard sleeves that they were wearing. So they literally just lay back in the bed for hours. Um, they were taken to the bathroom and they were fed on a regular basis. That is the bathroom based on request and food three times a day. Uh, so all of their physical needs were met. One of the things they found was that requests to go to the bathroom skyrocketed because that was the only way to break up the monotony of what occurred. But what they found was, I mean, that would be great, wouldn't it? A hundred bucks a day, you and I can pay a lot of bills just lying there doing nothing. Seems like it would work didn't work that way. It turned out the average person could get through about two days, but by the third day they were beginning to manifest evidence of, of active hallucinations. That it was, it was the beginning of loss of cognitive control of, of uh, ongoing features. There was the loss of the ability to organize thoughts, um, performance deterioration occurred, and hallucination showed up. So that for the welfare of the subjects they ended up having to cancel the experiment uh, within about three days. Interestingly enough, Lilly, in 1956, did one better than that. Uh, he exercised even more severe control over the environment. And what he was able to demonstrate was, in this case, what he used was a, um, a body temperature water bath. Not just was it body temperature, but what he had also done was to salt balance it. That is, he had measured the specific gravity of each individual subject and then put in enough salt in the water so that the water was exactly the same specific gravity as the people who were then being asked to get into it. And what he did then was to put a facial mask over each of them which supplied oxygen uh, and kind of like the old Lloyd Bridges films that you may have seen at some point, all you could hear was the of the of the air coming in and then bubbling out of the chamber and that was it the goggles had been painted over so again it was a uniform field in that case a kind of a light green but that's all they could see and in that case they had no clothes on and they just hung in that facial mask from that facial mask in a six by six by six tub of body temperature water <clears throat> in that case they got the same effects within about two hours in about two hours. Subjects tried various things, swimming, even rubbing their fingers together, which they could do in that case. Um, but very quickly what happened was that they were engaged in fantasy work and yet again hallucinations. They were beginning to lose cognitive control and the average person could not go more than about two hours in that um, in that situation. Nowadays that tank is a, a commercial venture actually came out of that. You will sometimes see um, body temperature baths where they where they actually they put you in a chamber that is locked tight, well, not locked tightly, but it's clamped around your neck with a rubber seal, um, and then give uh, have you rest in, the, in a salt bath. And, and there has been a commercial adventure that has come out of that uh, of limited success. A variation of it is now actually in airports around the country that you may have seen, and that is where you get into the same kind of thing, but you're actually stepping into a, a, a rubber suit. So you can get in there in a business suit with your feet sticking out the bottom and, and your neck out the top. And what they do is inject water uh, into you from this chamber that surrounds you. That's a kind of the, the reverse of a, of a uh, stimulus uh, variation effect, or it creates a very invigorating stimulation, and it is described as quite relaxing. But in the absence of stimulus variation, you begin to lose ability to attend, effects of set tend to disappear, and the overall effect is, is, um, is, is quite disturbing. So the bottom line conclusion relative to this is essentially that stimulus input or variation is necessary. You and I judge the rest of the world in the context of, what, of the environment in which we are appearing at any given time. Um, 
for instance, you know the, the, the kind of step walk that Michael Jackson uses in his dance routines where he moves his feet individually but in fact does not move his body forward in a given situation. If I were up on a blank stage and were going through that, if you were looking just at the standard background and my body, you would infer that I was walking even though in fact I might not be. And in that case, the absence of a background leads to active misinterpretation of what's actually going on. If you see me walking across the stage in front of a blank screen, the context around me leaves you, leaves you with no difficulty in interpreting, yes, he's moving left to right or right to left, whichever way I'm going. But if the background is uniform, if there's no variation in it, no variability, you can't tell whether I'm moving or not against a totally plain background. The background, the background of experience that that stimulus variation provides is, is the context within which we interpret our world. And it allows us basically to anchor the object of our attention in the particular context within which it's, um, in which it's operating. Um, now let's look at another thing. Let's, let's look now for the last uh, several minutes here at some of the theories that have been developed to try and explain what is going on here. And that is what we're looking at now is, is essentially selective attention and processing capacity. That's what we're going to look at, having, having detailed what we mean by attention. And the first of several theories that were proposed here is what's called the filter or bottleneck theory. One of the activities that is involved and on which this, this research has been based is what's called shadowing. What is happening in shadowing is that you are looking at or listening to a particular kind of event. You are attending to one object exactly while you're tending or trying to, to register another set of information. Although we don't label it as such, that is essentially what you're doing in the example that I talked about earlier. When you go into a cocktail party, and you get heavily involved in interacting with somebody in the, um, in, the, in, the, in the group that you're attending to, and then all of a sudden somebody mentions your name in another group next door, and all of a sudden you're grinning into this group and your ear is way over here listening to that other group. There is a case where you're shadowing. You haven't been actively paying attention to what's going on in that next group, but the very fact that your name is mentioned over there gets through a lot of the filters that are otherwise applied because when you're, a t think about it for a minute, when you're in a conversation, in a group, two, three, five, I don't care how many people, but if you're participating actively in a conversation, your attention is largely focused on that, particularly if it's friends, particularly if they're talking about something that's of interest to you, and you're actively involved in the conversation. That takes a lot of active processing to do. And so you're busy interacting, you're trying to figure out what is she saying, what's he arguing, do I agree with it, and how do I disagree politely, but, but uh, as a leader. And in effect, it takes a lot of our skills to do that. And all of a sudden, pops through all that, hey, they mentioned my name over there. That single event causes a lot of problems for the theories of attention. Because what clearly is going on there is that although you and I are concentrated, are focused on attending to and interacting with the particular people we're talking to, very clearly that thing that has happened in the other, in the other group has gotten through. So what that says is that you and I actually are processing a lot of the background information. We just make a decision at some level not to process it or not to go any further with it. It's trivial, it's not important, but wait a minute, my name, that is important. We like our reputation, we want to know what people think about us or are saying about us at a moment. So that somehow has features that allow us to break through. In some ways that becomes a kind of an acid test for the various theories that we, um, that we talk about. Um, and so in essence, the, the, um, the model that we're going to talk about here first is, is Broadbent's model. And what that model involves is, is shadowing. I guess I led up to that and then I lost my track and placed in my notes here. <laughs> Essentially, we define shadowing as listening to the message in an attended ear and repeating aloud what is heard as soon as it is heard. Okay? So you are, per, for, there are several different variations in which this has been done, but one way to do it is essentially to wear stereo earphones. And what they will do is say, okay, you are to pay attention to what's in the left ear. Okay? And what you hear in the left ear is something like three letters, E, K, G, to pick a very trivial example. And what it turns out is going on in the other ear is numbers or something like that. And now all of a sudden what happens, they've given you several trials on that so that you're hearing and reporting out that you hear the left earphone E, K, G, and you repeat E, 
kg. Now all of a sudden what they do without telling you is they feed E into the left ear, one into the right ear, on the next signal they switch it. They put K into the, into the, into the right ear and two into the left ear. And then in the third element they switch it back again. So if you actually reported what you heard in the left ear, you would hear E, 2, G. But in fact what happens, they find, is that what you actually hear is, uh, what you report out, is E, K, G. Think back to set as we were talking about it. You have been set in that case to think of letters and you've been set again to, to understand, okay, they're always putting letters in the left ear. That's where you attend and what happens is an event which is otherwise indistinguishable comes in in the other ear. You just integrate it, don't even think about it. That's where the original demonstration of nayhood <coughs> occurred. They simply put a cough on the other side and switched it and inserted it. So you heard nayhood. <coughs> and you very quickly heard it as neighborhood because the bore was over here as another way of doing that. So in essence what's happening there and the reason that becomes such a difficult model is that the Cherry in 1953 did the early studies and what he found essentially was that subjects could report quite accurately on a message in the intended ear, uh, attended ear, not intended but attended. Intended is the, is the experimenter's perspective from the attended ear. But what he also found was that in the unattended ear, they could detect, for instance, whether it was a man or a woman that was making the, the um, that was doing the, whatever was in there, letters, words, and so forth. They could also identify whether the signal was noisy, just noise, or meaningful. That is, they could report something like a cough or an actual letter or number, whatever it was. What they could not do was assign actual meaning to it. Now that's going to be an interesting problem for the models that we look at. That is, you can, what it's saying essentially is that you can, if you think about it a minute, the sex of who's talking, whether it's meaningful talk, that is conversation or language, or just static, is a physical attribute of the, of the, of the signal. Those clearly we can process. If you've got letters or words on the one side that you're paying attention to, and physical attributes on the other side, even if it's also words or letters, you can separate out the physical aspects of it so that you can tell when asked afterwards was it, the, was it a male in both ears, was it a female in both ears, or was it a different sex person in one ear as opposed to the other. Those you can distinguish. What you cannot do when the signals are in parallel with each other, if you're attending to the one ear, you cannot then report the meaning of whatever was done in the other ear. Okay. That again is a limit that's going to be on the models. That is, it's something the models are going to have to be able to explain. And you'll see as we look at the early ones that it doesn't work, that the models don't handle it. So the first model we're going to look at then is what's called Broadbent's model. And it looks like this. It starts with an incoming stimulus, this model. And it puts that stimulus into what are called the sensory registers. These are things like your ears, your, your sense of hearing, your eyes for the sense of vision, even your skin for the sense of touch. Those are all incoming channels and they have sensory registers, short-term recognition of, of the, stimuli that is, the stimuli that are coming in. Okay, It's going to be discussed in more detail in, the, in a later lecture, but basically it engages in what is called pre-attentive or partial processing. The incoming signal in those sensory registers is at least partially processed Though Broadbent's model doesn't argue so. What he argues is essentially that, that, um, it, 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 that what happens is that all of that information from the sensory registers is sent directly into what he calls a selective filter. That filter essentially also becomes a bottleneck. And hence that is the name that is often attached to the, um, to the, to the um, model that is the Broadbent's theory has also been called a Broadbent, uh, the, the, the bottleneck theory. It's a bottleneck model because what it's arguing is that, that not everything that hits the sensory registers actually gets through that selective filter. And in fact that filter um, determines based on the various features above, the mechanical aspects, the meaningful aspects and so forth, what is going to be processed further. So in essence here, very early, is where a limiting device is put on it. That is, the capacity becomes quite limited at the level of the selective filter. Because in accord with, 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 what, with what goes through 
What is not selected, what is not attended to by this model, isn't processed any further. It goes nowhere. That, as we see, is already going to disagree with some of the data that we've, we've just talked about. Okay, so that the, the, um, the limiting capacity uh, channel, uh, or I should say that differently, the limiting capacity in this model becomes the channel. Essentially, that what's, what's being argued is the incoming information is all received, but the first thing it does is to go through a selective filter which attends to only part of it and stops the processing of everything else so that only one piece of information goes through there and that is occupying the channel that this theory argues exists, the single channel that this theory argues exists. One of two things happens at this point. If you're in the middle of a conversation, certain feedback from long-term memory is brought into short-term memory, but the net result is that you respond in some way. You tell what you heard in the, in the left earphone if that's what you've been asked to, to respond to, okay? But it is, it is a model featuring basically a detecting device, device that assigns the meaning. So that basically what happens in this model is that the detecting device is what assigns meaning, whether it's a visual signal, uh, an oral signal, a URAL, uh, a touch signal, and so forth. And those signals do differ. You know, somebody who's arguing with you or sitting next to you who taps your shoulder will touch you very differently than if your boyfriend or girlfriend is sitting next to you and tries to catch your attention. The touch from him or her is likely to be much more gentle and maybe in a much more affectionate place, too, we might mention. Um, but in essence, the, the nature of the signal that's coming in is quite different in that situation, and you know it immediately. But this model is arguing that what happens is that that selective filter significantly narrows the overall information that is being processed, and that is the only thing that moves forward into the detecting device which, which assigns meaning to whatever has been, has been heard or seen, sensed. And from that point then, the information goes into short-term memory. Uh, some would argue it's already in short-term memory when the processing occurs, and then into long-term memory for storage. I haven't put all the arrows in there because you'd have arrows going every which direction, but obviously when you're in conversation, the bulk of it is coming out of long-term memory. Um, the information that you're relaying to people, um, you know, somebody's just had an illness and, you know, everybody's, you know, really? Uh, and, and you then feed out information that you have recently learned and other people may not yet have available to them. Um, so the net result here is that we have a model that has some rather difficult problems with it. For instance, one of the difficulties with this model is the following. When listening to one ear, people can still detect their name if it's spoken in the other ear. So the tape that is being fed into the other ear, all of a sudden there's your name right in the middle of it while you're busily attending to the left hand ear. Where could that happen in the broadband model? And the answer is there is nowhere. Because as the model says right in the middle there, or, or implies right in the middle there, there's no way for that information to get through. So in essence then, uh, Broadbent's theory basically has no means by which this could happen. That's a problem for the model. It's not sophisticated enough. <coughs> Clearly what's happening here is that some additional information is leaking through. How? There's no way in this model. That in turn leads to the next model that we're going to look at other than Broadbent's model, which is essentially the following model. This one is going to be the model of Anne Treisman. She argues for what is called an attenuation model. In the attenuation experiment that she ran, what she did, building on Broadbent's ideas, was basically to shadow, ask people to shadow the message in one ear, ignore the message in the other ear. Okay, same thing that Broadbent had used, essentially. The difference was, that now what happened is that she found that subjects could in fact track meaning to the other ear. So that when a signal that was meaningful to the individual occurred in that second ear, whether it was integrated or simply running separately, the subjects could in fact pick out and, and move that information through. What she argues in her model is that it suggests that meaning has been analyzed in that situation, that it has been analyzed. So what do we know at this point? Let me, in fact, let me just show you the rest of the model. She has now, instead of a, a selective filter, she has instead an attenuation control. There is moderately, monitoring, I should say, of the information that is coming in. It still leads to a limited channel capacity, 
which in fact may create a response. But the difference is now that there is more interaction going through there. And I forgot to put in two arrows coming out of that. There should be, there is a limited channel capacity, but there are two things or more coming through that model. Screw that whole model, whole description. But in essence, Treisman's model is arguing that more than one piece of information may become, is coming through. So what do we know at this point? Basically what we're arguing is that input undergoes as many as three tests depending on what's needed um, of its physical properties. Okay, I've jumbled the, the emphasis there. Three tests are going on depending on what's needed. But the processing that's done here is only of the physical properties of the signal that's coming in. <coughs> is that linguistic? Well, yes. What it does, among other things, is allow us to be able to group words, group individual elements into words. It allows us to identify words that are coming in and it allows us to assign meaning. The model, is, as it's been proposed by Treisman, has, been, has allowed us then to assign meaning. Separating stimuli according to this model then would become easier because at a cocktail party, when your name is, is expressed in that other group, the attenuation control will allow you to process the information that's coming in on the one ear and yet have room, channel capacity if you want, to process the information out of the other ear. Somebody's singing loudly, the, the added emphasis may lead you to have to process more closely, put additional attention into the processing to separate out the words on the different channel. If they're talking loudly, you may even have to add a third element because, yeah, you can follow the melody and kind of fill in the words automatically, but if you don't have the melody to tell you that they're saying, oh, say, can you see by dawn's early light, um, then you may have to, you have to process more carefully um, in order to pull out that third level of, of, um, of meaning. There are basically two differences that show up in this model versus the, the, the previous one. The first is that selection in this model is now based on physical properties and a very crude analysis of the properties of the incoming information. The second model suggests a more complete analysis of the incoming signal. Treisman's model allows for more complete processing. And secondly, the loss of material is complete with the first model, but the simple attenuation um, leads to a, a less significant loss of information in the second model. The processing seems too complete for, for limited performance that can be based on information presented through the non-shadowed channel. But then where is the bottleneck? And that's where we're going to pick up our lecture in the next, our, our theme in the next lecture, is looking at where that...